Welcome back to part B of lecture five, motor system lecture five, part B. So this is where we get to discuss diseases affecting the motor system. Mm -hmm. So these diseases affecting the motor system, many they are also affecting structures of the basal ganglia. Because we say the basal ganglia is involved in coordination of movements and also modulation of motor movements. So if certain structures are damaged with the basal ganglia, it will result in two specific diseases that we'll be discussing here. So the motor behavior is determined by the balance between the direct and the indirect striatal outputs. Remember, we had the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. So the direct pathway is stimulatory with regards to movement, so it's going to facilitate movement. The indirect pathway is inhibitory, so it's going to inhibit movements. So the balance between the direct pathway and the indirect pathway will now determine the balance of motor function. So sometimes you can have exager exaggerated stimulation of the direct pathway that will result into hyperkinesia, or there could be exaggerated stimulation of indirect pathway that will result into hypokinesia. So starting with the hypokinesia disorders, the hypokinetic disorders from the name itself, hypokinetic, it means that there is reduction in movement. So in this case, when you have insufficient direct pathway output, so it means that movement is reduced, and then you have excess indirect pathway output, you're going to have a hypokinetic disorder because here you're going to have reduction in movements. It is hypokinetic or hypokinesia. The other word for hypokinesia is also called the blood kinesia, blood kinesia. Then the opposite is called hyperkinetic disorders. In hyperkinetic disorders, we have excess direct pathway output and insufficient indirect pathway output. So it means that movements now are facilitated more. Then there's less inhibition of movements. So the end result is exaggerated motor movements, which is called hyperkinetic disorder. So let's start by looking at Parkinson disease. So by now you agree with me to say you've discussed this disease maybe in pathology. So I'm not just going to waste much time looking into details. I'm just interested in the physiology point of view of this disease. How does it come about? What structures are affected? And if those structures are affected, what normally happens? Why do you appreciate these clinical signs? So the Parkinson disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease and second to Alzheimer's disease, which is the first one. So the most common neurodegenerative disease is called Alzheimer's disease, then followed by Parkinson disease. So this Parkinson disease was described by James Parkinson in 1817. So this is a scientist that described the Parkinson disease. And it was noticed that it was common in old people. So anyone who is 50 years and above, we find that they are more prone to this disease because it's a neurodegenerative disease that is affecting mainly the substantia nigra pars compactor, the cells that are dopaminetic, that are producing dopamine. So there are quite a number of examples of people who have suffered from this disease from the past. So we have Michael J. Fox, Muhammad Ali, the famous Muhammad Ali, Pope John Paul II, Janet Reno, and Catherine. All these suffered from Parkinson's disease. The pathophysiology of this disease, the primary thing is there's loss of negrostriatal dopaminergic projections. So the dopaminergic projections, remember from the substantia nigra, the substance that is black, you have dopaminergic neurons that are projecting to the striata, to the corpus striata. So they are projecting to the putamen and 
the coded nucleus. So from there, they're going to facilitate the function of the direct pathway. They are going to inhibit the function of the indirect pathway. So if they are facilitating or enhancing the direct pathway, that will result into an increase in movement. If they are inhibiting the indirect pathway, somehow they are also increasing the movement. So if you have destruction of those neurons, it will result into Parkinson disease. So you can see from this diagram, you have the substantia nigra, the pars compactor that is destroyed. Then you don't have these dopaminergic neurons. And these dopaminergic neurons, they are projecting to the striatum. That's why they are called negro striato dopaminergic neurons. They're starting from the substantia nigra and then they are projecting to the striata. So with a person, if you have a cross section of the brain of the person who has suffered from this disease, Parkinson disease, you find that you can't really appreciate the substance which looks black or the substantia nigra. So in a normal person, you can see this substance which is looking black this is the midbrain, cross section of the midbrain. So you can appreciate the substance that is looking black here. But in individuals that have suffered from Parkinson's disease, you can't really appreciate the substance that looks black because those neurons are destroyed. So what happens? It means that the substantia nigra pass compactor is not transmitting the dopamine to the corpus striata, which is the caudet and the putamen. So it's not releasing dopamine to D1 receptors of the direct pathway. It's not releasing dop uh, dopamine to D2 receptors of the indirect pathway. So what happens? Without dopamine stimulating the D1 receptors, it means the direct pathway won't be enhanced. So there'll be slow function of the direct pathway that will bring about hypokinesia or slowness in movement. So you can see the direct pathway won't be stimulated that much. When that happens, it means that this globus paridus internal segment won't be inhibited. There will be less inhibition of the globus paridus internal segment medium spine neuron that is projecting to the thalamus. So this is inhibitory. So it means it's going to inhibit the, the thalamus. So once the, the thalamus, the ventral lateral and the ventral anterior complex of the thalamus is inhibited, then these neurons won't fire to stimulate the cortex to get that kind of movement. So there will be less movements or there will be inhibition of movement that will bring about hypokinesia or blood kinesia. So it's difficult to initiate movement. It's also difficult to stop movement once they have been initiated. Why? It's because you know to say that the indirect pathway is also not being inhibited. So if the indirect pathway is not being inhibited, then it means it will bring about activation of the indirect pathway that will also minimize movements. So there will be bloody kinesia, uh, blood kinesia because of insufficient of dopamine as a result of damage of negro striato dopaminergic neurons. And the other cause of this disease is related to the genetics. So there are genes that have been that have been implicated to cause Parkinson disease, and these are alpha sinonucrein and also patin DJ1 genes that have been implicated in causing uh, Parkinson disease. Okay, so a person with Parkinson disease, what would be the symptoms or clinical presentation? The person with Parkinson disease. Of course, we say the direct pathway is inhibited. The indirect pathway is not being inhibited. So it means that 
there will be slowness in movement because now the inhibitory neurons that are inhibiting the thalamus will increase inhibiting those thalamocortical projections that are supposed to stimulate the upper motor neurons. So if those neurons are inhibited, the upper motor neurons won't be stimulated, then there'll be less stimulation of the muscles by the lower motor neurons to produce a particular movement. So there'll be blood kinesia or hypokinesia. So some of the symptoms, you're going to have resting tremors. So resting tremors of the hand because you can't control the contraction and the relaxation of the extremities. So sometimes you can have resting tremors where you have uncontrollable muscle contraction and relaxation. Then there will be slowness of movement, which is called blood kinesia or hypokinesia. So this slowness of movement is because the direct pathway is not being enhanced by dopamine via the D1 receptors. Then there will be rigidity of the extremities and the neck. The rigidity of the extremities is due to an increase in muscle tone. So you know to say that some of those upper motor neurons, once they are stimulated, they are inhibitory to the reticular formation. So the reticular formation is the one that is involved in muscle tone. So if the reticular formation is not inhibited, you'll find that the descending motor neurons that are descending from the reticular formation, they are not going to be inhibited. They are going to be stimulated somehow, and those are going to excite the alpha motor neurons. And these alpha motor neurons will bring about contraction of the extensor muscles and also contraction of the flexor muscles. So if that is happening, the muscle tone is going to increase. So you find that if you want to do passive movement of the joints, as you are trying to do passive movement, there will be that friction or there will be that resistance because of rigidity in extremities. You find that the neck will be stiff and also the hands, the legs will be stiff because of increased rigidity of these extremities as a result of an increase in muscle tone. Then there will be minimal facial expressions so because there's also an increase in muscle tone to the face muscles, so you find that there will be minimal facial expressions. Somebody will lack your facial expressions. You wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell if somebody is upset or is happy because they are unable to do those facial expressions. So they will be more like they are wearing a mask. So they will have a mask face without facial expressions. And then, there will also be short walking steps. So like I said, it's difficult to initiate movements. And once you initiate movements, it's difficult to terminate the movement because we said the major function of the basal ganglia is to initiate and also to terminate motor movements. So without that normal function, the basal ganglia is difficult to initiate movements. It's also difficult to terminate movements. So when a person starts walking because of slowness in motor function, you find that They'll be walking slowly with a short walking steps, as if the baby was walking when you're just looking at the footprints. You are able to tell that this person maybe has got the disease because of those short walking steps. Then sometimes there is absence of associated movements, such as the arm swinging. So under normal circumstances, if a person is walking, the arm swings back and forth like that. So that's the arm swinging. So with a, with a person suffering from Parkinson's disease, you find that that kind of arm swinging movement is absent because it's very difficult to initiate a movement. It's also difficult to terminate a movement. So you find that the arm swinging movement is also absent in certain individuals. So these are some of the clinical signs that you're going to appreciate. So you have motor clinical signs like tremor, the blood kinesia, rigidity, loss of postural reflexes. So there's also loss of postural reflexes. Sometimes there is depression and then sometimes there's loss of memory, which is called dementia. So these are some of the clinical signs of Parkinson's disease. And by now you understand why you're having these uh, clinical signs when you're looking at the function of the basal ganglia with regard to the input that is coming from the substantia nigra, the pars compactor.
So these are the clinical signs. You can see tremor. So these were supposed to be a video, so you can't really play them here. So you can see the tremor of the hands. Then you have this person lacking facial expressions. expressions. So there are no facial expressions. So it's more like a person who's just wearing a mask. Even if you crack a joke, they won't laugh. You won't really appreciate that. If you annoy them, you won't be able to tell because they are unable to do that. Then there is that kinesia, slow movements. If you ask somebody to lift their hand, you find that it's very difficult for them to do that. And once they start, that kind of movement is also difficult to terminate that movement. So they will start exaggerating the movements. Then there's lots of postural reflexes. So you can see this individual, when you ask them to stand upright, you find that they have some difficulties in doing that because the muscles that are involved in posture, there is miscommunication, uh, difficulties in, um, there's difficulty in controlling those muscles of posture. Then rigidity, if you're trying to do passive movements, in this case, it's very difficult for you to do passive movements. Why? It's because there's increased muscle tone, so there's contraction of the extensor muscles and the flexor muscles, so it's very difficult to do movements, especially the extremities. Treatment, the primary treatment for Parkinson's is administration of the dopamine precursor, which is called L-DOPA. So this is initially effective, but after five to 10 years, 50% of the patients who develop DOPA-induced dyskinesia, which is a special type of hyperkinetic disorder as a result of using DOPA, because it's going to exaggerate the function of the direct pathway. Then you start overdoing the movement. That will bring about hyperkinesia, which is called DOPA-induced hyperkinesia or dyskinesia, dopa-induced dyskinesia. So the main treatment is levodopa or L-dopa. Then sometimes it's followed by dopamine agonists that can be used. On top of that, when you're using dopa, L-dopa, sometimes you can also give dopa decarboxylase inhibitor because if there is excessive production of this dopamine, it will result into more activation of the direct pathway. So sometimes L-DOPA is also given with the dopa decarboxylase enzyme inhibitor. That is going to inhibit excessive conversion of L-DOPA into dopamine to regulate the concentration of dopamine neurotransmitter. So L-DOPA simply stands for LAVO dihydroxyphenyl alanine. So this is an amino acid, which is called dihydroxyphenyl alanine, amino acid, which is a precursor amino acid for dopamine neurotransmitter. So this dopamine is also classified in the group of particulamines. So it's the same drug that, that can also be used if somebody is lacking catecholamines or they have insufficient catecholamines because from L-DOPA you can also produce other catecholamines like norepinephrine or epinephrine, okay? So the enzyme that is going to convert the L-DOPA into dopamine is called DOPA decarboxylase. So the DOPA decarboxylase is the one that's going to convert. So you find that when you give patient L-DOPA, then the enzyme will be able to convert the L-DOPA into dopamine. And then it will have the same effect on D1 and D2 receptors, as we have already explained. Then there's also other possibilities of treatment. So there are studies that are still going on trying to see how best we can treat this disease, Parkinson's disease. For instance, there is also gene therapy. A gene therapy is just correction of disease through introduction of new genetic information. So you just introduce new genetic information that can 
result into coding for enzymes that are able to convert L dopa into dopamine, or they are able to produce dopamine. It's important. So this is called gene, gene therapy. Then there is also fetal midbrain cell transplant into the codet in the putamen. So sometimes you can transplant fetal midbrain cells. So these fetal midbrain cells, they are able to synthesize and also release dopamine. So if you transplant them into the codet and the putamen, these are the corpus striata. So you find that if you transplant these cells from the fetal midbrain, they are able to synthesize and release dopamine because these neurons, they can express an enzyme which is called tyrosine hydroxylase. That is also key in the production of dopamine. Then the other possible treatment is neurografts using stem cells. So you have neurografts using stem cells and you know stem cells, these are self-renewing cells, they are malpotent progenitor cells. So they can differentiate into dopaminergic neurons. So they have the potential to differentiate into anything. So if you give these neurografts stem cells, you also need to give the stimulatory factors that are able to stimulate these cells to differentiate into cells that will be able to produce dopamine, which are called dopaminergic neurons. So they are the same stem cells that can be harvested maybe from a fetus, stem cells that can that have multipotent. For instance, we have multipotent stem cells that can differentiate into different groups of blood cells. So they have the same characteristics, even these stem cells are able to differentiate into dopaminergic neurons. As long as you also give the factors, stimulatory factors that to stimulate these cells, the stem cells to differentiate into dopaminergic neurons that will start now producing dopamine. So those are some of the treatment. Then the other form of treatment are deep brain stimulation. So the deep brain stimulation the activity of the subthalamic nucleus is increased in Parkinson's. So it's going to increase in Parkinson's. The activity of subthalamic nucleus is going to increase in Parkinson's. And this, these patients have bilateral subthalamic nucleus stimulating electrodes that are installed in there. So a high frequency of stimulation is going to inactivate the subthalamic nucleus. So they are not going to start stimulating the inhibitory neuron that will bring about hypomovements or hypokinesia. So in other way, you are inhibiting the indirect pathway. So if the indirect pathway is inhibited, that will facilitate some sort of movements. Moving on to another form of disease. So these are called hyperkinetic disorders. So the hyperkinetic disorders, an example is Huntington disease, where you have chorea. So you have choreatic syndromes. Chorea, these are involuntary abnormal movements, dancing movements. That is very common in Huntington disease. So some of these hyperkinetic disorders, we have Huntington disease, dystonia, tardive dyskinesia, dopa-induced dyskinesia, hemibalismus, and Torrance syndrome. So these are some of the examples of hyperkinetic disorders. What are the causes? For Huntington, this is a genetic disease, so it's genetic, autosomal dominant, something to do with chromosome number four. Okay, and then we have dystonia, that is also genetic or idiopathic, whereby the cause is not known. Tardive dyskinesia is a chronic neuroleptic use, so if we are using neuroleptic drugs, that can also destroy certain structures of the basal ganglia. It can result into tardive dyskinesia. Then we have 
Parkinson's therapy that can cause dopa induced dyskinesia. Then hemibalismus. Hemibalismus, we have unilateral vascular accident that is affecting the subthalamic nucleus. So if the sub if the subthalamic nucleus is affected, it means that you are destroying the indirect pathway, which is inhibitory to movement. So if it has been destroyed, then there is no inhibition to movement that will bring about hyperkinetic disorder or hypermovement. These are involuntary, violent, excessive movement, especially affecting the extremities. Then the towering syndrome is due to excessive D2 subtype dopaminergic receptor expression. So sometimes if you have more of this D2 type, it's going to inhibit the indirect pathway. So if the indirect pathway is inhibited, then you have also excessive unwanted involuntary movement that can result to that. Okay, so we'll discuss a bit um, Huntington disease or Huntington chorea disease. Then from there, so like I said, this is not pathology. So we'll just add some more information on Huntington chorea disease. So the choreatic symptoms in Huntington's. So you have involuntary and wanted movements. Chorea, these are dance like movements. Then there's also anthetosis. So these are changeable movements, dystonia, this is torsion spasms that will bring about abnormal posture because of these torsion spasms that can affect the neck, the hands, or muscles that are involved in posture. So some of these diseases or hyperkinetic disorders that will exhibit core. So the first one is Huntington disease, just a bit of information. This is not pathology. So the pathophysiology of Huntington disease. So the major cause of Huntington disease is atrophy of striata. So there is selective atrophy of the caudate and the putamen with associated degeneration of the frontal and temporal cortices. So there is the degeneration of also the frontal and temporal cortices on top of that, you have atrophy or degeneration of the caudate and the putamen that will form the striata. So in short, there is atrophy of the striata. And this will result into disorders of movements, cognition disorders, and also behavior disorders that is associated with Huntington. So there's loss of striato, garbagic neurons, then the neuropathological sequence, the first thing that you're going to see is loss of striato, GABA, encephalin, D2, receptor neurons, which is affecting the indirect pathway. So once the indirect pathway is affected, that will bring about hyper movement. Then the second thing of the loss of striato, GABA, dynaphin, D1, neurons, the direct pathway. And this is also associated with the cortical atrophy, especially the, the frontal cortex and the temporal cortex that will also bring about other issues. So there will be alteration in mood, for instance, especially depression. There is change in the personality that is often take the form of increased irritability, suspiciousness and also impulsive or eccentric behavior. Then on top of that, the hallmark of the disease is mainly the rapid jerk motions with no clear purpose, which are called chorea or dance-like movements, motions. So you can see in this diagram, the person with chorea, when you do the cross section of the brain, you can see there's atrophy of the striatum, there's enlargement of the ventricle, the normal one, you can see the ventricles, the lateral ventricles are small, but in Huntington disease, the ventricles becomes larger 
Why is it because there is atrophy with the surrounding tissue, which is a, the striatum. And on top of that, you can also have atrophy of the, the frontal and the temporal cortices. Clinical signs, you have chorea or choreatic gait. So a person as he's moving, as if they are dancing, it's just this unwanted movement that they can't control. There is dystonic movement, abnormal posture. You can see this patient here is, ra is raising her hand, but no one is telling them to do that. Why? Because there's a movement that is being initiated against her will. So abnormal posture. So the airy motor signs, you have chorea, these are brief involuntary movements, dystonia, abnormal posture. Then we also have cognitive abnormalities. There is executive function. So executive function, complex tax, it's very difficult for them to do that. Then sometimes you have poor retrieval of memory that will result into dementia as well. The psychiatric changes, depression, psychosis. Then later on, there will be mobility. It's very difficult for these individuals to move, weight loss, and then death within 10 to 25 years after diagnosis. So this death is mainly due to pneumonia. So the Huntington disease, the striatum has atrophied. So I find that the function of the striatum is not there. So there is no inhibitory signal to the globus paridus external part and globus paridus internal part in the direct pathway. So if this neuron is not inhibited, it's going to inhibit, it's going to be stimulated. And once it has been stimulated, it will bring about activation, less activation, and there will be an increase in excitation. That is the direct pathway, the indirect pathway, if the globus paridus external segment is not being stimulated, so it's reduced here. It means that if the cordate or the epitemin is damaged or atrophied, there's degeneration of these medium spine neurons that are projecting to the globus paridus external segment in the indirect pathway. So if this inhibition is not there, it means that the inhibitory effect of the globus paridus external to the subthalamic nucleus is going to increase. That will result into inhibition of this stimulatory neuron that is projecting to the globus paridus internal part. So this inhibitory neuron will not be somehow inhibited. Why? It's because this neuron that is supposed to stimulate the inhibitory neuron projecting to the thalamus is going to be inhibited. So that will result into inhibition of this neuron. Then less inhibition, there will be excessive movement. That's why you have hyperkinesia in Huntington disease. So those are abnormal movements of extremities. So these are abnormal, violent movements of the extremities. The cause of the Huntington disease, like we said, is genetics. So abnormal mutation of gene in the short arm of chromosome number four will result into this disease. Then sometimes there are cell death and the, the cause is not yet known, it's not certain. There's also excitotoxicity. So excitotoxicity via the NAMDA receptors that can kill the medium spinal neurons that will bring about atrophy of the striata. Other diseases is dystonia, like I said. So dystonia, like I said, here you have abnormal posture in dystonia. So there is involuntary muscle contraction that cause repetitive and twisting movements of extremities and this may affect maybe one part of the body. Sometimes it can affect the entire body. So if it's just one part that is affected, 
So you can see dystonia in one part of the body is called focal dystonia. If it's two or more adjacent parts, it's called segmental dystonia. If all the body parts are affected, the body parts are affected, then you have the general dystonia. So this kind of disease sometimes can be treated with botulinum toxin. So there's no cure for this disease, but sometimes you can try to minimize the symptoms by giving botulinum toxin. And you know to say botulinum toxin is going to inhibit the release of acetylcholine. So it's going to inhibit the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic membrane. So once you have inhibition of the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic membrane, there is no stimulation of cholinergic receptors. So the muscle fibers won't fire end rate potential, no action potential, no muscle contraction. That will result into reduction in muscle activity, reducing the movements. Then the other diseases, so you can see dystonia, and then the other disease is tardy of dyskinesia. Tavid dyskinesia is another disease, neurodegenerative disease that will cause repetitive involuntary movement, such as grimacing and also eye blinking. So there's grimacing and eye blinking. These are repetitive movements. Just find somebody is just blinking, not stopping doing that. Why? It's because you have these repetitive involuntary movements that can affect different parts of the body. And it's caused by long-term use of neuroleptic drugs. These are antipsychotic drugs that are basically used to treat schizophrenia. So some of these drugs can affect the neurons that will bring about tardive dyskinesia. So the symptoms here, again, they can be treated or minimized by giving botulinum toxin with the same mode of action when you're treating dystonia. Then dopa-induced dyskinesia is as a result of using, overusing treatment for Parkinson. So this treatment of Parkinson L dopa, if you use it for a long period of time, it will result into dyskinesia because there will be so much of dopamine, there will be excessive stimulation of the direct pathway, excessive movements. So it will bring about hyperkinetic disorder. So it's called dopa induced dyskinesia because it's, it's because it's, it's, as, it's as a result of dopa or dopa drug treatment or the drug that is given to treat Parkinsonism. Then the other disease, hemibalismus. So this is unilateral subthalamic nuclear stroke. So if the blood vessels that are supposed to supply blood to the midbrain, especially the uh, subthalamic nucleus, that is just about the midbrain, if it's damaged for some reason, to result into destruction of the subthalamic nucleus. So if the subthalamic nucleus is destroyed, then it means that the indirect pathway somehow is blocked because the indirect pathway is the one that passes through the subthalamic nucleus. So if those neurons are destroyed, then the indirect pathway is not there. There is no inhibition of movement that will result into abnormal movement. These are excessive abnormal movements. So it's hyperkinetic movement disorder that is characterized by unilateral, violet, wide amplitude movements involving mainly the ipsilateral arm and the leg. So it's ipsilateral, that's why it's called hemibalismus. So it can affect the left side of the body or the right side of the body. Sometimes it can affect the, the entire extremities, which just becomes balismus. So the major cause here is just the destruction of the subthalamic nucleus. Then the last one there, the Tourant syndrome. This Tourant syndrome it begins in childhood, sometimes adolescent stage, childhood and adolescent stage. At adolescent stage, it's common. It's also a neurological disorder that involves repetitive movements of 
or sometimes unwanted sounds. So we find that somebody is just producing unwanted sounds, maybe coughing, sneezing, but they are repetitive. Why? It's because there is destruction on certain neurons within the brain stem that will result into abnormal movements, and these are repetitive movements. Okay, so most of this information you've already covered in pathology, so this is just where I'm going to end. Thank you very much for your time.